Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Anne Hood. Anne is a novelist and short story writer. She has also written nonfiction. She's the author of 14 novels, four memoirs, a short story collection, a 10 book series for middle readers, and a young adult novel. And today we will speak about her latest book, Fly Girl, a memoir about her life as a flight attendant. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. So, Anne, this is one, uh, this is a sexist job, as you mentioned in your book, but at the same time, it's a job that the, so many people want to do. You know, I had a friend, this friend, I, I live in Montreal, this friend of mine, she spoke about five languages. She was dead gorgeous. And all she <laughs> wanted to do was to be a flight attendant. And she was telling me oh, how much trouble and how much competition and how many girls and series of interviews she had to go through in order to get this this job and and it's been about 10 years and she still loves it uh, anyway so i'm just so full of curiosity about about your life as a flight attendant but i also see that well as i mentioned in the introduction you are also a writer you have written all these novels memoirs and this and that so i wonder if you could tell us a little bit of your love for writing and then your love for being a flight attendant you know i i wanted to be a writer since i was a little girl and i, I know a lot of writers who will say the same thing like you read a book as a child and it makes you want to sort of create stories or live in a story. For me, it was the novel Little Women by Louisa May Alcott, it took place during the Civil War. And it's this mother and these four very creative daughters. And I just wanted to be like one of those March daughters. And since I couldn't be, I started writing stories that were kind of spin-offs of that, and then including things from my life. And I was a huge reader, and that combination of reading and loving language. Well, it just makes you want to be a writer. I, I grew up in this tiny town in the tiniest state, Rhode Island, and it was an old mill town and all the mills had closed and it was, it was you know, economically depressed. And um, I had great dreams of leaving there and being a famous writer, but then I didn't know how to become a famous writer, but I read a book called How to Become an Airline Stewardess when I was 12 and it offered me a glamorous life outside of my little town. And so I wanted to do both from a very young age. I was constantly told that smart girls don't become flight attendants or airline stewardesses in those days. And I was also told that people don't become writers just because of the town you know, where I grew up. And I don't know, tell me I can't do something and it really makes me wanna do it. <laughs> You know, and many authors have told me this, this same thing that you just said that you, since a little girl, you like to write stories. And this is the first time I asked this question. What does that mean? You were writing like a little 50 page story or a hundred pages and who will read them? And, and what was your criteria to write this story? Was it just to uh, fulfill your imagination or to share something with someone? No, you know, I think it was really a, an exercise in imagination. Um, like I remember walking down the street, you know, in my in front of my house, and there was an, a, a mitten someone had dropped in the snow, and it was so exciting to me. Like, who dropped it? Um, will they come back? And I created a whole story for the person who had dropped that mitten, and I ran inside, and you know, I wrote in longhand. Uh, with a good old fashioned pen. And I wrote like a 15 page handwritten story about that mitten, you know, and, and this, the, the story I imagined about it. Um, I showed them to my dad. He was one of my earliest fans. And he, I would read it and he would just say, babe, I can't believe you thought of that. I can't. And so he got me so excited about what I was doing, you know. Um, my cousin and I had sort of a bamboozle operation where we wrote a newspaper and sold it to our relatives on Sundays. And that was more like when I thought about, well, maybe writers work for newspapers. You know, I didn't know what to do with all the ideas I had. So I tried out as a little kid, all different ways to write. I wrote a play that I forced my classmates to perform. Some of them still don't speak to me after that, even though we were only eight. Um, but I tried everything because I just loved stories. Wow. Okay. Then, okay. You 
read this book, How to Become a, a Air Stewards, and also you love writing. Uh, how did both of them develop? So, you know, when I was told that people don't become writers, you know, what was unsaid is people from our town don't become writers because many of the students in my high school didn't go to college. Uh, unemployment was so high. And my guidance counselors and teachers, I loved them all. Like I had a very happy experience in school, but they couldn't guide me with what I wanted to do. And so I thought after reading Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald and not just their fiction, but about their lives, I thought, oh, I get it. A writer needs to have adventures. And so I remembered that book I read, you know, as I was getting ready to graduate from college. And I was like, if I went to work for an airline, I would have the adventures that writers need to have. And somehow that will help me get to, to being published. Kind of, kind of strange logic I, and, and false logic, but my love of travel and my love of stories sort of seem to feed each other. Yeah, and I heard it many times. I don't know who says it that uh, in order to become a writer, you have to have something to write about. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I led a very sheltered life. I didn't have a heck of a lot to write. I mean, I'm writing about mittens in the snow, you know, so I needed a little more. <laughs> okay, well, you mentioned in the book that uh, it was at the beginning of deregulation in the airline industry. Mm -hmm. So I, I have... I don't know what was the world when it was regulated. So first of all, can you tell us what was like the airline industry when it was regulated and then how, I guess, it degraded after it became deregulated? Yeah, you know, it, that was actually one of my biggest challenges to write about because it's kind of dry. I had to somehow figure out how to weave it into my personal story and make it interesting and understandable. So before 1978 in the United States, the government um, decided all the prices for airline fares. And they also decided if an airline could or couldn't start flying to a new city. So it was not a lot of freedom. And I think, you know, the average fare, the, the cost of flying from New York to LA was about $1,200 before 1978. So in inflation dollars, that's a lot of money. Um, as a result, a lot of empty airline seats, right? And a lot of people not flying. And so Ted Kennedy um, came up with the bill Uh, to deregulate the airlines and to get the government out of it and to sort of have people, um, airlines compete, open up all those places that people had to wait years to start a new route. And um, it passed the year I was hired. So in 1978, um, we were told about this change, but you know, I, my head was swimming with everything we were told about. And I hadn't understood what regulation was, never by deregulation. And it took several years to actually take, uh, for the changes to begin, but it had a huge impact on the airline industry. Um, many of the biggest airlines actually ended up going out of business, TWA, my airline included, um, because of it. Competition just got too tough, you know? Right, okay. And what is, what is that glamour that attracts so many young women towards this industry? Is it the, the discovering a new, I mean, you describe uh, when you were reading that book that you could have, I don't know, breakfast in New York and dinner in Miami? Yeah, or, or like, you know, the book was even wilder than that. It's like breakfast in New York, dinner, you know, lunch in Madrid, <laughs> dinner in London. It's like, that's not really possible, but it sounded pretty exciting. You know, I think I, I say in the book, but it's, it's absolutely true that I think I was the stereotypical girl who wanted to become a stewardess. Small town, stars in my eyes, big dreams. The idea of glamor, you know, I grew up watching movies, including Boeing, Boeing, the movie about flight attendants and, you know, being these glamorous women. Um, I didn't fly as a kid. We, we took our trips in our station wagon, you know, back and forth to Pennsylvania and Indiana and not very exciting trips. Um, but the idea of it, Um, just captured my imagination, you know. Um, I did imagine myself sort of floating down an, air, an airplane aisle with little pillbox hat on. That wasn't the, the world I worked in, but, you know, when I was a kid, that's what it was like. And just having adventures and seeing the world. And, you know, to me, that seemed pretty darn good. And can you tell us about the parts of the world that you saw coming from a small <laughs> little town and being flown around everywhere? Every, I mean, it, I, it never got old. It was always exciting. 
Um, it's true that I, I did my share of like small trips to places that aren't, you know, so desirable, like Detroit, no offense to Detroit, but, you know, Detroit or Columbus, Ohio, or a lot of small cities, but I was lucky enough to mostly fly to the places I had imagined. So in the beginning, I did a lot of trips to Los Angeles and San Francisco and Las Vegas. And then I went on to international and really I, I went everywhere, Cairo, Athens, Tel Aviv, Paris, Rome. And, you know, in, in a month or two, I might visit all of those places. So um, how can it not be exciting to get off a plane and see an alphabet that's not yours mm. and see people dressed completely differently and see things you only write about in history books? You know, that doesn't, that's always exciting. Okay, and how about, can you tell us some of the downside? What are the things that Earth tours complain the most or they regret or, or they are so unbearable that they end up quitting? Oh, I know. Um, I think that, you know, um, passengers who are misbehaved mm -hmm. can really wear you down. I, I hate to say that that's the biggest thing, but sometimes people are, I've, I heard so many flight attendants say, I'm just done. I just can't keep being nice and not get enough back for it, you know, and just being blamed for things like the weather that you can't take responsibility for. That didn't bother me as much as it does bother some people, because I always thought of it as I am going to be with this bad passenger or this whole plane of bad passengers sometimes for six hours, and I'm never going to see them again. If I worked in an office, I'd have to see these people every day, right? So that didn't bother me so much. What, what really... I thought the biggest negative for me was I was always tired. I always had jet lag. My feet were always sore. I never knew what time it was. I mean, once I, I literally called in tired, not sick. I said, I'm so tired. I just can't come to, I can't do the flight. Um, and they were, I wasn't the first person to do that. So I think that takes its toll. Yeah, about passengers being difficult. Uh, I mean, you haven't been part of this, but uh, if you could imagine, the life of our airline stewardess now during time of COVID. Uh, I, I even saw during the news that a passenger hit a girl in the face because she asked him to put the mask on. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you could, you are not part of it, but if you could just paint the scenarios, the kind of life a, a, a airline stewardess has to live right now. Oh, I have thought about that so many times um, when, when airlines started flying again during the pandemic, before I actually started flying again, and hearing the stories and hearing what flight attendants had to endure um, and how sort of a respect for them was really, I think, kind of diminished, if not lost, at a time when they were actually doing quite a big job, you know, keeping the airplane safe. Um, I mean, I read, as I'm sure you, you heard some of these stories too, but someone actually knocking out a flight attendant's teeth, like punching her and knocking out her teeth. And it isn't like one isolated story. We heard a lot of them. Right. Um, and it was the first time probably since I stopped flying that I got on a plane and didn't wish I had the job because I was like, this, they're really up against a lot of hard stuff right now. I'm glad I'm on this side of it now. Uh, I, well, pardon me for asking you this, but uh, how is the dating life for? <laughs> I mean, as a as a young man, I always say, "Wow, that that girl with this French accent or that Italian accent <laughs> or this I don't know uh, uh, Middle Eastern <laughs> scarf." I, I, I was as a young man. I mean, and, and now when I jump into a plane and say, and I see a beautiful air stewardess, I say, "Wow, I'm happy to be here." <laughs> So I imagine, I imagine for you, I mean, you were even in modeling. I imagine you had a you share of propositions. You know, I don't know. This is sort of a trend in my life, but I got a lot of propositions from the people I didn't want them from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I actually only dated a handful of passengers and most of the dates were pretty disastrous. Wow. My friends, my roommates, they dated all the time and had these great dates and flew off to Kansas City to meet a guy they had met. And I just kind of wasn't getting that. Like somebody would ask me and I'm like, you were the one asking me out, no, no, no. But I did on a flight meet someone who became my long-term boyfriend. So I did fall in love with 47F on a flight from San Francisco to New York. And um, we started going out immediately and, and went out for about five years. So 
love was in the air. <laughs> and, and how, how does that work? I mean, you get a passenger and he says, what's your phone number? And can are you free? I, I, I couldn't imagine what would be the scenario of me asking a, a, a air stewards for, for coffee. How does it play out? <laughs> well, I asked him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blushing, I have to admit. Uh, there was an incident with a passenger on the flight and we had to file a police report. And so, and I'd been talking to this guy the whole flight, you know, as much as I could when I wasn't handing out food and drinks and stuff. And um, a flight attendant came up and said, you, you have to come up. And when we land, you have to go talk to the police because you were involved in this incident. And I was thinking, I can't, this guy's gonna might ask me out and I want to go out with him. But she moved my, I had to move my seat and I had to talk to a policeman. So I quick grabbed a cocktail napkin and I wrote my phone number on it and I, and my name. And I said, dear 47F, if you ever want to go out, here's my phone number. So now I'm talking to the police after we land and the passengers are coming up. It was a big plane and they're coming off and coming off. And I see that he's walked past me. So I called 47F, I have something for you. And he, he surprised, he said, you do? And I hand him the napkin and he read it right there. And he says, I'll call you tonight. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, okay. And what would you say to a girl that today would like to get into this profession? Are you, will you encourage her? Or will you discourage her? Or what kind of information will you give? You know, there, there have been so many young women who are sort of went to college, didn't know what to do with their major, or got some job that was boring and wanted something exciting. I have advised so many people, just go and work for an airline for a year or two. Get, you know, you gain such independence and confidence. You know, I was a 21 year old, you know, skinny kid from Rhode Island. And by the time I had flown for eight years, I was a, a you know, a more worldly woman. And that's because of, having to learn to deal with people, traveling on my own. Sometimes I was on layovers in cities by myself, learning how to order in restaurants by myself, how to walk onto a first class you know, section and, and make everybody feel at home. I mean, I just learned how to be in the world. And I think it's still, despite what's going on because of the pandemic, which we hope will, is on the way to getting better, I think it's a great job for a young woman. Mm. Can you um, talk about the sexism? How does it manifest? Wow. It, you know, it exists. It's a real thing. Um, I think because of the time in which I began, sexism was so rampant. It was, I got hired in 1978 that we had just started questioning, is it okay for this to happen? So it was so mm -hmm. far and so different from the world we live in now. So I think a really good example is we were taught how to sit, how to perch is the word, on the arm of a first class seat to get a man's drink order with our legs wow. crossed. Wow. So we looked sexy and pretty, but we were also taught that we had professional jobs and we were fighting for more pay and all the things women were fighting for in the seventies. So it was such a contradiction really. Mm -hmm. The sexism was built into the job, but, but the era was telling us we didn't have to do that. Okay. And what was, uh, I, mean, I guess in a way you told us at the beginning of this interview, mm -hmm. but what was the motivation to write this book in particular? Oh, you know, that's a really good question. I, I'd had it sort of in my mind every now and then I would think I should write about it because people seem so curious, you know, and maybe it would be interesting. And then I would think about it. I was like, is that really a whole book's worth of interesting? But there's nothing like a pandemic and being locked in your house and not being able to go anywhere. Not, not only on an airplane, I couldn't even go to the grocery store. You'll remember back you know, in the beginning, that really motivated me. Maybe this is the time to write about when I did and could go anywhere and everywhere. And it really helped me through the, those months of lockdown and fear to relive that freedom and, and sort of carefree life I had. And uh, can you tell us what was the thing that uh, drove you towards uh, getting out of the industry? Did you quit? Did you, did you get fired? Did the company go bankrupt? <laughs> what happened? Um, in a way, I got fired. So TWA was bought by a corporate raider named Carl Icahn, who's still raiding corporations. Um, and That's his, one does. 
as one does, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and one of his goals was to, to get rid of half of the flight attendant staff. We had 6,000. He thought you could pay less and have less people. A cat. Sorry. I, I saw him. I saw him. Yeah, it just knocked something over. Um, and so he wanted to really reduce the number of flight attendants, but also reduce our pay. So we went on strike. It's actually one of the most famous labor strikes in the United States, contemporary one. This was in 1986. And basically um, we lost our jobs. He fired everybody, went on strike. And so my career ended in the blink of an eye. I came back from a flight. I'd worked a flight to London and I played my answering machine. In those days you press the button. So I like six messages pressed the button and it was TWA, a representative from the union calling to say we were on strike and I never wore that uniform again. That was the end. Wow. Talking yeah. about pay, what's the pay like? Is it something living wage or below or above? I mean, can someone pay the rent? <laughs> you know, that's, that's a great question because one of the things that was lost because of deregulation and the unions that were busted as a result of deregulation a job that had a really nice salary with a lot of benefits because you got a per diem for being away from home and you got extra money if certain things went wrong or took too long. That all went away and people lost pensions and took great pay reduction. So the pay now is not so great. Mm. Um, so I have a niece, she's 21 years old, which is the age that you started working on. Yeah. Uh, if she, if she will ask you if she should go into and working for an airline, what would you say to her? Go for it. Go Absolutely. For it. Don't think twice. At go least for a year fun. or so, right? That's right. Do it for a few years. You know, um, I didn't think I would stop. I didn't know when I would stop. I didn't think about stopping. Right. And then they were stopped for me, but, um, I know people who have flown for 40 years and they're still happy. <laughs> uh, we're, we're coming to the end of the interview. Is there any story that I neglected to ask you that you would like to share? Well, now you read the books, so you know, I have a lot of interesting passenger stories um, and a lot of um, serious ones or funny ones. Um, but I think that one of my favorite stories is the day I was on a, the liquor cart And I asked someone, you know, what would you like to drink? And as I turned toward him, with, you know, to put the napkin on his tray table, I realized that he was sitting in his shirt, like a dress shirt and tie and just his little white underwear. And I knew he had him boarded that way because we would have stopped him. And I said, sir, where are your pants? And he said, up there, in the, you know, the overhead. And I said, well, you have to wear them. And he said, I can't. I'm on my way to a job interview and they'll be wrinkled. And I felt, I felt great empathy for this guy. Um, and this is where, you know, you learn how to handle people in situations. So I said, I understand and got a blanket and said, could you put this over your lap? And that guy sat in his underwear with that blanket over his lap. The wow, whole that's time. Very, that's very <laughs> Every day was an adventure. Well, and thank you so much for sharing this those stories with us. I wonder if you could tell us one more time the title of the book and where can the listeners find it? Yeah, the title is Fly Girl, and it's at any bookstore that you frequent, um, independent bookstores, and of course, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and whatever the Canadian versions of those are, and um, it, it will be on shelves momentarily. Okay, well, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was great talking to you.